So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Huck. I'm a co-founder and treasurer of Pennsylvania Lime. We're very pleased this evening to have Chris Newby uh, presenting uh, a presentation on the secret history of Lyme disease. Uh, our moderator and facilitator is William Moore, who is our uh, technology officer on the board of Pennsylvania Lyme. Uh, before we jump into a little bit of an opening and then an introduction to Chris, uh, some just general housekeeping. Uh, if you have questions, go ahead on Zoom. You can ask any question on Zoom. You're going to see a chat function and a question function. Go ahead and just uh, enter any question that you have. If you're watching this live stream on Facebook, you can ask your questions Probably what we're going to do is collect all the questions that come in and Bill will organize them so that at the end of Chris's presentation, we will be able to group questions together so we can kind of have a continuity flow of the discussion. So the pre presentation tonight may not be as long as some of the others. We wanted to allow ample time for questions and answers. Um, and it's going to be very clear why that's going to be important. What I'd like to do is go into my screen and I want to share, I want to share my screen. Um, the virtual line impact series that we've been doing, um, just about every one of our local support groups, live support groups, we have 18 in the state of Pennsylvania. We're not doing face-to-face -face meetings because of COVID, because of sheltering, social distancing. It is certainly not appropriate to have uh, large gatherings. So we are doing a virtual Lyme impact session um, on the second Tuesday of every month. We're working on our lineup for the remainder of the year and we're getting some pretty big name speakers. I think tonight is an example of that. Um, if you've read the book Bitten, you realize what impact uh, the research of that book has done to further the discussion of Lyme disease and its origin. So to have Chris Newby with us tonight really is simply an example of the caliber of speakers that we're getting. So with Chris's presentation, um, I'd like to maybe just take a sec second and, and give you a little bit of a backdrop of a conversation that I had about two weeks ago. A friend of mine called me two weeks ago and he said, I got bit by a tick, it's fully engorged, what do I do? Um, I'm the go-to guy in my little community for Lyme. I run the Harrisburg Lyme Support Group. So I get calls regularly of this nature and, and worse if somebody's having a difficulty with treatment. So what I directed him to, and I would, I'm sharing this for all of you, so it may not be apropos exactly now, but maybe someone you know down the road. I directed him to ticklab.org. Go online, ticklab.org. It's part of the East Stroudsburg University. It's a tick research lab. And you can go on there to first get the tick tested. So I coached my friend how to remove the tick, what to do with the tick. He followed these instructions. As we were talking later, he said to me, I was not aware that ticks carried as many diseases as they do. The list that you're looking at in front of you now is 11 of the co-infections plus Lyme, Borrelia burgdorferi that ticks carry in the state of Pennsylvania. So as he was talking about the different diseases, his comment to me was, well, do all ticks carry Lyme? And the answer is no. But in terms of prevalence of infection, it's about 50-50. In the state of Pennsylvania, it's about 50-50 that they're carrying something. My personal belief is it's higher than 50%, because if you look at all of the co-infections, chances are it's probably higher than 50% that they're carrying something. So we started going through this, and uh, 
you can go on their website, you can pull every state in the union, you can pull down every county in Pennsylvania, and you can start searching for prevalence of Lyme for different uh, diseases and co-infections. So what you're looking at on your screen in front of you, this is for deer ticks, 35% of all of the deer ticks tested, 17,000, a little over that, um, had Lyme disease, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. 18% of them had anaplasmosis. What I was surprised to learn, we talk um, with the tick lab quite a bit, and anaplasmosis is now starting to become more prevalent than some of the other co-infectors like Bartonella. So 18%, almost one out of five ticks. For Barton, Bartonella, 14% of the ticks carry it. And I thought this was pretty interesting. 3% of the ticks were diagnosed with Babesia. The reason I thought this was interesting is I know lots of people with Babesiosis. I know a lot of people, myself included, that, you know, and Babesia is not a bacteria. It's more like a pathogen, like a microbe, maybe similar more to like malaria. And the way that you treat Babesia is uniquely different than how you treat Lyme disease. So the challenge for my friend, as he was going through this process, is he was wondering, which of these tests should I take? So what you're looking at is the deer tick panel. Um, and for free, I don't know if everyone can see that, the way that I've got the drop down boxes of the speakers here, I can actually minimize that so that you, I can see most of it. So the basic for Lyme, Babesiosis, and Anaplasmosis is no cost if you're a resident of Pennsylvania. If you want a more advanced test, more comprehensive, so five co-infectors plus Borrelia burgdorferi Lyme is 50 bucks, and the comprehensive is a total of 12 diseases. And I said, you know, really for, for my money, why don't you just go and do the comprehensive uh, test is what he did. So what's interesting, here's his results. When you go through the process and you remove the tick and you send it to the lab uh, and you follow their instructions, these are the 12 co-infectors plus Lyme that will be registered in terms of what your tick, that tick was carrying. So look at what you notice there. Borrelia uh, burgdorferi, which is Lyme on the top positive, but also Borrelia myomotai was positive and Borrelia general species. There's a bit of conversation in the Lyme community about what does that really mean um, and if you remember, um, we had, um, we had a, one of our earlier speakers was uh, Dr. Burascano, and he was talking about close to eight or nine uh, Borrelia diseases here in the East Coast. And most of these tests aren't really looking for that. So you can see what uh, this individual's tested positive. Look at the upper right hand corner where it says fully engorged for 100 hours. When I got this report from him, I called him right away and I said, oh my gosh, this thing was in you for four days. And he said, I had no idea, no way would I know. Between changing clothes, between showering, between you know doing inspections, he works outside. He said, Eric, I'm pretty cognizant and literate when it comes to tick, tick awareness and prevention. I would have never thought that. An interesting fact for, for how they uh, really detect that is, picture a deer tick. And if you're looking at a deer tick, the back of the head and the shoulders is called the shield. And that's a black coloration for a deer tick. And below that's the body. So the shield never grows. When the tick feeds off of a host, the body will engorge, but the shield does not. So they have a way of measuring the difference between the size of the body to the shield that never grows to say how long it actually was in the, in the individual.
So once we did this, his next question to me, forgive me as I'm clicking around, okay, now what do I do? So I asked him if he had a bullseye rash. He said, yes, I got a bullseye rash. And okay, it's proof positive. You have Borrelia, you have the infection, you need to find a Lyme literate medical doctor. I directed him to palyme.org. Um, you can go to our website, you can search around for the doctor referral network. You just simply put in your zip code, your address, where you're located, and we will get back to you with two or three Lyme literate medical professionals here in the state of Pennsylvania that are taking new patients. Um, I will say that a lot of the doctors don't take insurance, but there are plenty that do. So if that's a consideration because of finances, we can help work with you to find the Lyme literate doctor. Uh, and we know all of them and really, they all really are saviors in our book. So just by a way of introduction, I wanted to give you a little bit of a backdrop of the role that PA Line plays in working in our community here in Pennsylvania. If we have helped any of you that are listening, if we have made a difference in your families or your community, your organization, if you're a member of one of our support groups, now more than ever, we really could use some financial assistance. And you can see how to actually donate if you choose. And of course, go to PA Lime on our Facebook. So with that, what I'd like to do is do a, a brief introduction of Chris Newby. Um, and I knew a lot of Chris's background, but I didn't know all of it. Um, and I'm really pretty excited to say that she's an award-winning science writer. She's the author of the book, Bitten. If you have not read that book, seriously, rush out and buy it. It's one of the best written books. It really takes a very controversial subject and it really breaks it down in layman's terms from the science aspect and the research. Just done, just done a phenomenal job, great book to read. She's also a senior producer on the documentary Under Our Skin. That is a uh, documentary that was premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2010. It actually became a semi-finalist for an Oscar award. Um, if you haven't seen Under Our Skin, I highly recommend it. Uh, the follow-up documentary is Under Our Skin Emergence, which takes the story five years later, seven, eight years later, to see how the people have developed. So previously, Chris was a technology writer for Apple, other Silicon Valley companies. She has two degrees in engineering, a bachelor's degree from the University of Utah. She has a master's degree from Stanford University. The thing that really ingratiates Chris to our community is unfortunately her story. And her story is she was vacationing in Martha's, Martha's Vineyard. She was bitten by an unseen tick, um, and that just really pulled her into the abyss of a very devastating, silent illness. It took over 10 doctors and years for her to figure out what the heck is going on. Why is my body breaking down? Why can't the medical community and my doctors figure it out? And that's really what started her journey to go into the science and the research of, well, what is Lyme disease? What is its origination? And knowing that really strengthens our position when we talk to others, and it's really a very supportive process and a book for, for us. So with that, Chris, allow me to turn it over to you. And again, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We appreciate it. Well, thank you for the invitation. I, um, I am so glad to be able to speak to Pennsylvania because they seem to be the hardest hit state right now as far as tick-borne diseases. I, you were saying they were number one for Lyme disease for the last seven years, which is astounding. So, um, and 
I, you know, I was working at Stanford as a science writer for 10 years and I quit the first week of March to go on a 10 city, mostly East Coast book tour to spread the word about Lyme disease and co-infections and then the shutdown happened. So I'm just so excited to be able to reach people uh, this way now and share my story and hopefully make this sort of a crowdsourced investigation. So um, what, I'll, what I'll do is just, uh, you, that was a fabulous intro, Eric, so thank you so much. But I'll just, uh, I'll just do, a, I'm gonna walk you through sort of my thought process of how I got to this point. You know, before I had been bitten by the tick, I had no idea I would go down this journey this road, this long road, which now has been 17 years or something like that. But it's been really satisfying and I feel like um, it's done a lot of good in the, in the world. And so anyways, this has been a, a passion project of mine and I'm just really glad to share it. So I'm gonna show, I have lots of pictures and I'm gonna go fairly fast, but you'll be able to, uh, they're gonna post a copy of the slideshow if you wanna see it and review it in detail later, because really um, this is such a big program. We need a lot of people to be thinking about it and researching it if you're so inclined. So uh, I'll share screen now. Here we go. Does this look okay? It does, looks fine. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna start with telling, by telling you two stories. There's sort of the public facing Lyme story and then there's the secret backstory that um, no one had really put together um, before I published the book. And, you know, the public facing story is a feel good story. It's about a heroic, scientists and the miracle of antibiotics. Uh, the second story, the backstory is sort of dark and some people have labeled it as conspiracy theory, but I think if you read the book, you'll realize I'm an engineer and a science writer uh, and I'm a fact-based gal. And I, I'm pretty careful in the book to say, this is, this is what we know and this is what we don't know. And this is the backdrop of the history because you have to put it in context to totally understand it. And this is where we need to go to like get these people um, to, 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 make, to make, to fix the situation and get people better. So um, let me go to the next slide. Let's see. Oops. Let's see what's going on. Oh, let me start slideshow. Maybe that's it. So there's my husband and I, 2002, we're on the Elizabeth Islands right off Martha's Vineyard, fairly close to uh, Cape Cod and Lyme, Connecticut. And, um, you know, we were bitten a week after we got back to California. We, we didn't see a tick, we didn't see a, a bullseye rash. We just were sicker than we'd ever been with brain fog, fatigue, pain, inability to function in the world. and. Um, like Eric said, it was 10 doctors a year to get diagnosed, and then it was five to six years before we were fully functional. Now, the public-facing story is, um, is simple. It's uh, Polly Murray, um, mother of four, started documenting, documenting a mysterious illness that hit everyone in her family in 1965. Uh, she rattled on doors and uh, made a lot of noise. And finally, the CDC, who investigates strange outbreaks, uh, assigned Dr. Alan Steer um, to start investigating uh, 10 years later. And uh, he, he started with Polly's data and then added his own and uh, decided it was a tick-borne disease. The Yale and Steer and his cohorts were pretty fairly convinced it was a um, a virus, and but because they couldn't find a bacteria in, in the ticks or the blood, and so they called in Willie Bergdorfer, America's tick expert, to help. And so um, 
1981, he published that he had found uh, a new kind of bacteria, a spirochete, which was named after him, Borrelia burgdorferi. And uh, that they, he put it back in rabbits and said, yes, definitely this spirochete causes this rash. He didn't necessarily prove that it was what was making everyone sick. And so when I first heard that story and really started drilling down, I'm saying, why did it take 17 years? Um, there's just, it felt like there was a missing piece to that story. Um, and, and so, you know, I, here's the rest of the timeline and, you know, why did it take 17 years? Um, while I was getting better, this curiosity uh, drove me to work with a very talented filmmaker, Andy Abrahams Wilson. And for three and a half years, we researched Lyme disease and interviewed experts and patients from all over the US and internationally. And um, I was the main researcher and a fundraiser. And I, I, I feel like the film did a good job of explaining the disease and how screwed up it is to friends and family. And I really made some inroads in sort of talking about the politics and the profit motives that make it really hard for patients to get diagnosed and, and treated. But still there was a few puzzling things about it. Um, why there was so much secrecy associated with the disease. And uh, during the filming, the last year of filming, we, we had had a lot of trouble getting anyone from the CDC or NIH to go on camera and to present a balanced uh, you know, view of the disease. We wanted people from both sides of the Lyme wars and with no, none of the government officials going on camera, we said, well, there's one person we can talk to, which is Willie Bergdorfer, the discoverer of Lyme disease. He's retired. So we flew out to Hamilton, Montana to his house and we were you know, setting up in his house and all of a sudden there was a knock on the door and someone from the lab says, um, you know, I've been asked to sit in on this interview and the director didn't let him in. But during that interview, Willie was pretty forthcoming about things that we'd never heard from the government. The first thing is they said, the government knows that a short course of antibiotics won't always work. The second thing he said is that the disease they know that the disease can be really harmful to children with developing neurological systems. And then we turned off the camera and he had a little sly smile. He said, I didn't tell you everything, which was intriguing, but we'd been working you know, for three years on the film. We had to get it out. Uh, he wasn't gonna talk anymore. And so we had to move on and we didn't hear anything from him for quite a few years until he broke his silence in 2013. That's a picture I took of him in Montana. Um, an indie filmmaker friend of mine, Tim Gray, got Willie to admit after a three or four hour interview that um, he believed that the outbreak around Lyme, Connecticut was linked to the US bioweapons program. And he told him accidents happen. Uh, that's about all the details he gave. But a few minutes later in a follow-up interview, he made more fairly jaw-dropping admissions. He said he'd worked in the US bug-borne weapons program for decades. He put plague in fleas, he put yellow fever in mosquitoes, and he um, tried to map, he was told he, he needed to find a way to mass produce ticks in quantity, uh, assumably so they could be dropped on the enemies. So that, you know, at that point, I was pretty tired of Lyme disease with the film and, and just uh, spending so long researching and getting over the disease. But I felt like it was an important enough uh, thread that it needed to be pulled. And so now I'll, I, then I did the deep dive into biological warfare. And I went to the National Archives and looked at some of these files. And so this is sort of the stuff I learned along the way. So if you think of this as a wagon wheel, Camp Dietrich in Maryland, just outside of DC, was the brains of the biological weapons program. And it was really um, almost as big and well-funded as the nuclear program, the Manhattan Project. And they enlisted, the program started in 1949. It employed about 13,000 employees, um, all branches of the military, 
hundreds of industrial contractors and about 50 of the top universities. And most of the projects were highly compartmentalized, compartmentalized just like in the Manhattan Project. So the contractors didn't know the purpose of their um, experiments. Now you can see there's a little CIA group embedded in, in Camp Dietrich and they were um, special operations division and uh, also called technical services division. And they did a lot of the crazy tick experiments that I'll describe later on. Also, um, Rocky Mountain Lab was the tick headquarters um, where if they needed a special tick for a bioweapon, they would go there. Plum Island was, they had an anti-crop program in the Cold War and that's where it would go if they needed something that might kill animals or crops. And then Dugway Proving Ground was our test field for the dangerous pathogens because it was in the middle of the Utah desert. So after World War II, both the Russians and the Americans collected the German and Japanese scientists. And that's when they discovered there was just like a very evil, extensive biological weapons program and a bug borne weapons program. So the Pentagon was shocked and their paranoia grew. And, and they thought, what if the Russians use this against us, which they did start developing their parallel program. So they went around looking for experts and they found Willie Bergdorfer who had just gotten his PhD in medical zoology out of the Swiss Tropical Institute uh, in Basel, Switzerland. And Gagi, who owned the, the research facility, his, uh, his family's company that had been going on since the 1700s um, was a chemical company and they, um, they invented DDT and they also sold the red dye that was used in the background of the Nazi flag. So they sort of played both sides of the war and uh, what Geige did a lot of times was take his talented scientists and place them in the bioweapons program, probably of both sides. So Willie um, was brought over and he ended up here at Rocky Mountain Labs, which was in the Bitterroot Valley on the west side of the western edge of Montana pretty temperate, really beautiful with mountains that looked a lot like Switzerland, but without all the rules and uh, protocols of Switzerland. So he, uh, Willie had a, started in 52, started a two year fellowship at Rocky Mountain Labs and he fell in love and married a local girl. And he was just super happy to be there. Um, now Rocky Mountain Lab was, was there, founded in 28 to study the most deadly tick-borne disease in the US, which is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. It's a rickettsial and um, that's how they ended up maintaining as large tick hatcheries with species from around the world. And then they also funded the lab's operations by selling yellow fever vaccines to the military. So Willie, uh, he was about, I think 26. He started his, he, he began working in the bioweapons program almost immediately as soon as he received his US security clearance and his kickoff meeting was in the UK, with, in Canada with UK and US experts on entomological weapons at the Suffield Experimental Station near Calgary, Canada. Uh, he almost, uh, Canada almost didn't let him in because his uh, German accent was so thick, he was so obviously German. And it was right after the war, they were paranoid, but he got in and that's where he first learned about, you know, uh, these experiments that I'll show you that he did and he took what the Germans and the Japanese did and uh, moved the science along. And he also worked for months at a time at Fort Dietrich on site as a contractor. So one of his first experiments was to artificially feed soft and hard ticks with some of the most dangerous tick-borne diseases. Um, he took glass capillary tubes and poked them in their mouths and fed them with Q fever, tularemia, leptospirosis, equine encephalitis, virus, Asiatic relapsing fever, rickettsia, prozaki, and the rabies virus. And this, uh, all these are documented in reports. And he also worked on the Colorado tick fever virus that was a weapons candidate for a while. And he ran a human, he helped to run a human vaccine trial on Montana prisoners. He also worked on putting plague, also known as Black Death, a bacterium that has killed millions, 
throughout the history of mankind in fleas. And these are blocked fleas, pictures from his lab notebooks. Um, the, tea, the fleas feed on infected mice or mammals or rabbits and the plague blocks, blocks their guts. These are called blocked fleas. And then they, they become hungry and dehydrated. So as soon as you release them, they try to find a mammal as soon as possible to unplug their esophagus and stomach. So he helped Dietrich work on efficient ways to raise, in fact, and store these fleas in bomblets so that they could be dropped on battalion size areas from airplanes. And at the time he did these experiments, he had two new babies at home. And you have to uh, believe that this created a tremendous strain on his young family. Here's a picture of the cluster bombs. Um, like one of them had little round bomblets and it was called popcorn because it looked like Jiffy Pop. Um, so anyways, this is uh, what would happen is they would load the fleas in the canisters. They, they would explode at a set altitude and it rained fleas down in a battalion sized area. And here's a picture from Dugway Proving Grounds, 50 miles as a crow flies from Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, the thing you have to understand with the weapons program is they, they tried a lot of things or a lot of experiments. So there, there were just tens of thousands of experiments trying out def, different biological weapons uh, with insects, without insects. So in my book, only focuses on the uh, bug-borne weapons. So here is the aerial view of the plot plan of all the guinea pigs that were laid out uh, on the Utah desert. This was called Operation Big Itch. So I sort of drilled down on this operation as an example of the kind of things they probably did with ticks that I can't get the documents on. But so they would put cages loaded with guinea pigs on the dots. And then for this particular test, they released a uh, half million uninfected fleas from their bomblets and, and dropped them on 125 guinea pigs. After analysis, it was determined that only 177 fleas found their way to the guinea pigs and the rest hopped off into the desert. Um, in addition, some of the airplane crew reported having flea bites. Nevertheless, the army report that this came from claimed that this operation was a huge success. So after a while, there was a parallel program where they, um, the bioweapons designers began mass producing microbes that can be transmitted by ticks outside of the insects because it, it, it can be complicated keeping two living things alive and dropping them from a bomb with uncontrolled humidity and temperature, et cetera. So they would, um, they did a, a rickettsia rickettsii was a candidate for biological agents. And again, the most deadly bacteria, tick-borne disease on the planet. So in this experiment, they, uh, pretty much killed or maimed 67 monkeys just to prove or to figure out the lethal dose that can be inhaled before you kill the monkeys. And what they would do is there was a series of experiments where they would freeze dry it. They would brew the rickettsels in large vats, freeze dry them into spores, and then spray them to either kill or chronically incapacitate, depending on what germ they were trying to, they found. Um, sometimes they would mix the bacterial agents with the viruses because there's documents that say the mixed infections would be hard to diagnose and treat. And, but as we all know, many of the microbes once inhaled by the animals on the ground could be spread by ticks and then be picked up by birds and spread around. So with any of the agents that they were testing for biological weapons, they needed a vaccine to protect their own soldiers. So. At Dietrich, they had this $1 million test sphere where they had human and animal volunteers inhale and uh, with and without vaccines. It's called the eight ball and mostly their vo human volunteers are seventh day Adventists, conscientious object object objectors who didn't want to go to war on the front lines. And uh, my friends at Dietrich said, make sure you tell them that no one died because of this. So anyways, there's, there's the one admission. Um, and for this presentation, I added a Pennsylvania component because I know you'd be interested. There was one open air experiment that I know of that was talked about uh, in Congress 
in the 70s and it was on the Pennsylvania Turnpike Tunnel. So what what happened in this is they took this um, this anthrax simulant, so it's close to the size and the property, physical properties of anthrax, is Bacillus globigii, and at the time they thought, oh, it won't hurt anyone. We're pretty sure of that. Uh, so they had trucks with sprayers on the back, and they went through two tunnels in the on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. So that's Kittatinny and Tus Tuscarora. I'm not sure I'm saying them right. And in August 1955, it was super hot. People didn't have air conditioners in their car then. The w windows were rolled down. They put sensors all along the tunnel. This truck sprayed out the bacterium, bacteria, and then they measured how far and fast it spread uh, as sort of a plan for how they would do it maybe in the subways in Moscow, et cetera, or in tunnels in Moscow. And while they thought it didn't hurt anybody, they did the same tests off San Francisco from boats and 11 people ended up in the hospital and one person died at Stanford Hospital near my house. So obviously it wasn't as harmless as they thought. And, and so this, you know, this is just an example of 239 open air tests using humans as guinea pigs that we know about just through the army. We don't know, you know, Air Force, CIA, you know, we don't have details on that because again, it's so secretive. That's just the location of the tunnels. Okay, another um, open air experiment involves Lone Star ticks. And this was published in the deep dark old literature and I sort of dug it up and connected it to the timing with the Lyme outbreak. So I look at this as new news that nobody put together. So the Army was funding studies on these weaponized ticks that could survive uh, in cold climates so, um, and, or in Vietnam. So they picked the Lone Star Tick, which was prevalent south of the Mason-Dixon line. And anybody who knows Lone Star Ticks, they're very aggressive, man-biting. They're, unlike deer ticks, they have rudimentary eyes, and so they can stalk their prey and swarm. They can live in a freezer for a month. Willie says they can live a year in a freezer. I haven't seen the data on that. And uh, Old Dominion universities found that they could live underwater for more, more than 70 days. Perfect for the swamps of Vietnam, right? And so uh, in these experiments that are in the open literature, though hard to get a hold of, uh, Old Dominion University was funded by the Army and the Atomic Energy Commission, where they released hundreds of thousands of ticks, a little over 100,000 Lone Star ticks in Newport News, Virginia. And what they would do is they had, uh, they would grid off a, an acre field or so, a meter squares, and in each square they would put a thousand Lone Star ticks, and they had made them radioactive because they would collect them in a few weeks, in months, and they'd collect all the ticks in a certain square, they'd bring them back to the lab, and they had this Geiger counter, so they could tell how many of the ticks from the Geiger counter, which are radioactive, um, and they stayed radioactive for their whole life, you know, how far they had moved. Then they would take those ticks from that grid and put them back in the grid and repeat this for years. And, you know, why did they do that? Well, if they're gonna drop ticks on the enemy, they wanna know, you know, how well it worked, how far you can expect the diseases in the tick to work. Now, at this time, I talked to the scientist who did this experiment, and he says, oh, these were clean lab-raised ticks. But as Willie said to many of his colleagues, there's no such thing as a, a clean tick. Also, they didn't have the, teal, the tools in the late 60s to know what really was in the ticks. Did they really have good viral detection? Also, I looked through Willie's lab notebooks. Um, one time he was sending ticks to um, the atomic facility at Chalk River in Canada, and he accidentally sent ticks with a dangerous relapsing fever up there. So even Willie made mistakes. So I, what I'm saying is it was really irresponsible to release this many ticks, non-native ticks in a new area. And even the scientists told me, oh, I could, I, you know, I could never get away with this today. So um, why, 
you know, why is this important? If you look at the outbreak of Lyme and, the, and these other tick-borne diseases I'm going to talk about, it all happened beginning somewhere in the mid to late 60s. And if you release a tick in Newport News, Virginia, it takes approximately five days for a seafaring bird to make it up north to Long Island. And, you know, uh, two years after these experiments took place, the first established colonies of Lone Star ticks were found on Long Island. So this is my looking backwards at the epidemic. Uh, there, there actually were three really uncommon, fairly deadly tick-borne diseases that all of a sudden appeared around Long Island Sound um, uh, in ni around 1968. Polly said her family was getting sick at 60 and 65. The dots on Long Island are people who died of some sort of mysterious spotted fever that didn't necessarily show up on the traditional tests for spotted fever. That's what first really um, lit up Willie Bergdorfer's phone because he was in charge of Riquetzel's at Rocky Mountain Lab then. But a lot of people died. Also, Steer and Polly Murray first noticed the Lyme arthritis you know, at the top of the triangle, which I call the Bermuda Triangle of tick diseases. And then, uh, you know, the very first in-man case of babesiosis, which before then was only in cattle, that was the second case uh, in, uh, in this area in the U.S. and the 11th in the world, so it was pretty rare. And you can see the star where I was bitten, so <laughs> I feel like I went to the Bermuda Triangle there. So super suspicious, but this just shows the physical evidence. So you have the Lyme arthritis, which is the Borrelia burgdorferi, or what we call it, spotted fever, rickettsia, which uh, was pretty deadly and did not show up in the regular rickettsia, rickettsii tests, and then the babesiosis first in man. Parasite, which, you know, Eric was saying, so I had babesiosis and uh, the thing that was interesting is when you're really sick with tick-borne diseases, your antibody complexes are super tied up. So when we first had the, the my husband and I had it too, so when we first had the babesiosis test, it was negative because our antibody complexes weren't picked up by the test. They were all glommed together. So sometimes you have to knock the co-infections down one by one before you know what's in you. And that's why testing the tick is sometimes the best approach, fastest. So here you can see that there was this, you know, antibiotics were widely available in, in 49, rickettsia cases dropped precipitously, seemed like the problem was gone, and then mid-60s, it just spiked. So, you know, the question is, could this be because of open-air tests with rickettsias, which are notorious for getting out of the lab, by the way, that you have to have a bio-level three lab and security clearances to work with it. There aren't many test labs that deal with it because of its, the security hurdles. But also the release of lone star ticks, you know, which deer ticks don't spread rickettsias, but lone stars do, along with the meat allergies. So during my research, I also lucked out in that the NIH, when Willie had retired, came and collected all his files, supposedly for historical purposes, but Willie had held some back, some with files that he didn't want the NIH to see for some reason. So as he got older in years, he actually believes he contracted Lyme from infected rabbit urine that he was, ex that splashed in his eyes when he was doing experiments. Um, but anyways, he released these original lab notebooks, which gave me important clues. Because I went to the National Archives and looked at all his papers and there was nothing about Lyme disease in the time period where he made his most important discovery in his life, which is uh, like Sherlock Holmes, the sound of the dog in the night. There was no sound of dog in the night. Why would there be nothing about his most important discovery in the National Archives celebrating his discovery? But there was something in the area, in the time frame, which was called Swiss agent. So here I'm showing you 
he received samples of Dr. Steer's human blood in 79, which is almost two years before his famous discovery. And you can see that they knew there, he knew there was Urquetzal in there because he, he was very well trained in microscopes, but it didn't test against all known Rickettsias that he had in his tick lab, except for this thing named Swiss agent, which came from Switzerland, which is a new organism he discovered in Switzerland that year. So it was alarming. So that happened in 78. And then in 80, all mention of this mysterious Rickettsial disappeared from the public literature. I mean, before then, the, he and Steer were trading letters saying, oh, I'm so excited. We finally found out what caused Lyme. It's this Rickettsial. Yay, we're going to you know, get Nobel Prizes. And then it disappeared. So that makes me look back at the timeline and think about it like an epidemiologist. You know, so 65, Polly Murray began um, documenting a mysterious outbreak. It, Yale was called in, they thought it was a virus. They finally punted it to uh, the tick experts. Willie Bergdorfer discovers this new Rickettsial. It goes away in 1980. Then a year and a half later, Willie says, oh, it's a bacterium, a spirochete. That's what causes it, and story over. But if you look at it with a filter from someone who studies biological, unnatural biological outbreaks, you know, there's, there's rules, they, signs they look for. One thing is unusual animal and people die off. So you had the people dying on, Rocky, on Long Island from spotted fever that didn't test for anything that we know about. You have birds dying, pheasants, Long Island duck industry, equine encephalitis, which that was a weapon and horses were dying, uh, uh, and a bunch of associated panicky military studies. So, you know, one, one question I always get is, well, was Lyme disease the bioweapon? Willie didn't say it was. I mean, we asked him directly. He said, uh, no, though he did say, I wish it wasn't named after me. Um, it, Borelli Bergdorferi would have been a horrible bioweapon because it's, it grows too slowly. It's hard to culture out, outside of a living thing in a flask or a Petri dish. I mean, my hypothesis is that um, it was a series of unfortunate accidents. There was the release of these non-native ticks that spread disease much more effectively than the native deer ticks. It was like CIA people and army people doing a bunch of irresponsible aerosol tests and maybe something got out in la out of the labs or in these t ticks that weren't adequately um, screen, so it's the perfect storm. So the central question of the book is, was Willing, Willie telling the truth? Uh, and I believe he was. Uh, was a weaponized tick and or encephalitis virus causing illness, also causing illness during the, the Lyme outbreak? I mean, Willie said, when I published my science article of the discovery, I was told to, to find ticks without the red seals in them. So that says, cover up to me, but I haven't found the smoking gun document to prove it. And, and how does secrecy harm the infected? Well, at this point, the lie, you know, the whole bioweapons thing is still, still secret. The government has declassified the tick and flea experiments, but I mean, not the flea and mosquito experiments, but not the tick experiments. And, and why is that? And, you know, what I'm, what I'm, heartened by is that Chris Smith, the re Republican congressman from New Jersey, is trying to add a budget line in the DOD budget to investigate and make force the government tell us what was released, where and when, because that would save research dollars. We'd know what to look for, you know, was anaplasmosis a bioweapon and where was it released in what year? And then we can, you know, start treating the people and, and doing the right tests to find out. So, um, you know, one of the most chilling findings was in Willie's garage where he had the hidden documents. There was one box that had all his really dark Dietrich experimental documents in there and lab notes. And there was a sticky on top of it that said, I wonder why somebody didn't do something. And then I realized that I'm somebody. So 
I mean, one thing that was interesting about the research, and I, I never knew it would be a biography of Willie, but it was tracing, like, thinking about the human. Is he telling the truth? You have to know his history, what was in his heart. I had a bunch of letters from him, you know, how did he feel when he was doing the early experiments and how did he feel when he was older and he realized the implications of the work and, and that maybe some of the work had led to people becoming ill and then he personally had the illness. So to me, that was really interesting. Um, I think Willie was telling the truth and we need, we need to get the government to disclose it. So um, I, I'm current, you know, I published the book uh, with a weight of evidence, you know, I, I, I have evidence that says in 1962, the CIA dropped infected ticks on Cuban sugarcane workers, um, a release of radioactive ticks on the bird flyway zone. The book um, proves that there was an unidentified rickettsial that could be contributing to the complexities of a Lyme infection case. And then, um, you know, I have documentation of many open air experiments on in other states and outside of the U.S. on live diseases that can be um, spread by ticks. So I, I leave the readers and listeners with a call to action. If you're a researcher, we need to start sequencing the ticks to find out like what are the co-infections in there and, and so we know how to treat and diagnose and test. To epidemiologists, don't say it's just climate change or three brand new inhuman diseases just showed up around the Bermuda Triangle of, of Lyme disease. Factor in that it could be military dissemination. The vectors could be wearing military uniforms. To politicians, we need to hold the military's hand to the fire and let us know, you know what was released. Are there vaccines that were in the works? Uh, protective clothing. And then to patients, you know, if you have this thing they called post Lyme uh, treatment syndrome, post treatment Lyme disease syndrome, you know, it could be a co infection. So make sure you're going with someone or you're going to a physician who's knowledgeable, like through Eric's network, who knows what to look for in these complicated mixed infections. So that's, that's my show. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Trying to stop sharing here. Yeah. Okay, Chris, thank you very much. If anybody has questions for Chris, we have plenty of time to take your questions. Use the Q&A feature uh, in Zoom or just leave a comment in Facebook and I'll start compiling those questions and uh, share them with Chris. Bill, I'm in the Q&A and it doesn't allow me to ask a question. I don't know if anybody else is experiencing that. Uh, we, we have some questions coming in, Eric, so I think, um, I think we're okay. Okay, first question. Do we know why they chose deer ticks? Well, uh, they were looking for an insect that wouldn't call attention to itself if they dropped it on an enemy. They, the first feeble, this is a rumor by the way, but there was a reported and alleged insect-borne bioweapons um, attack on Korea and they used non-native insects. And so <laughs> all the Koreans collected them and said, hey, you know, these insects aren't from here on top of the snow in the middle of winter, what's going on here? So, you know, Willie was brought on in part I think to like research insects or bugs that were native. And so like the Soviet Union has a certain species of hard tick that they worked with and, and then Lone Stars, I, you know, I don't know. They're definitely Southern ticks and can probably survive in tropical climates. Okay. Um, do ticks serve any good purpose in the environment? <laughs> uh, they're food for a lot of birds. Um, I think they weren't, I mean, when I was a kid wandering through the woods in the 60s, uh, I, nobody had this trouble. You know, I think the problem is when you introduce a new tick 
and a new germ to a population where there, where natural he, immunity hasn't built up. That's where you have trouble. And, you know, insect lives are so much shorter and they evolve so much faster than humans. So it's going to take us a couple generations to become immune to these new things introduced to our environment. And it's not just humans, you know, it's, we're having a mass extinction of all sorts of mammals and, and birds. And we have to look at the entire ecosystem with this problem. Okay, next question. When did the U.S. shut down the bug bioweapons program? Nixon announced it was shut down in 69, and it took a couple years to do it. So 72 was the official end of the program. Okay, next question. Did you use the Freedom of Information Act to access some of your information? If so, can you talk about your experience in using uh, the Freedom of Information Act? Yeah, it's, uh, I still have many uh, open requests out and it's very frustrating, it's, it's fairly worthless. So during the film, I was trying to get the emails between the NIH and the CDC and some of the researchers in the universities who had sort of cozy relationships and that there's a potential for them to profit from their patents and the grants and discoveries. Uh, and then through the Lyme guidelines, recommend their tests, which may not be that good, right? So I requested just some emails between a handful of, of people. Now, normally, if you were at a business and say, give me the emails for the last five years um, for these two people, how long would that take? You know, maybe an hour, maybe a day. So the CDC took five and a half years to fill, fulfill that request. And the film was over. So they regularly use a delaying tactic because then it didn't make it into the, you know, the documentary that was seen by all these people and is streaming for years. So that experience has been repeated over and over again. Like, for example, I was trying to get evidence during the book research on like where and when they released um, Rickettsils and viruses in open air situations. So I got a reply just about a month ago and it said, it says, that document is unclassified, but we can't give it to you because of national security. So I find the Freedom of Information Work will act fairly toothless and frustrating. Um, a new book came out by Nicholson Baker called Baseless, which is his 10 year pursuit to try to get hard evidence from biological weapons. And it's, you know, it's just so frustrating. And it, you know, the last paragraph he says, the government needs to release everything that's over 50 years old. This is just ridiculous. It's torture for journalists and researchers the way it is now. Okay, Chris, I have my own question that I'm going to slip in. Okay. Um, the Swiss agent. Yes. Um, what role do you believe it plays? Th those of us that are sick with Lyme disease, what role do you believe it plays? Um, obviously, I was never tested for it or... Uh, diagnosed with it, what role do you think it plays in the average person with Lyme disease? I, I think it's really suspicious that Swiss agent got buried. I mean, he, Willie mentioned it in his discovery article in an early draft that was handwritten that said, you know, we don't know the role that Swiss agent pay, plays in these Lyme infections. So in a good scientific article, you put something like in there so you can let future scientists research it later on down the road, but it got taken out in the final article and it, it disappeared forever. So I personally don't know how important it is, but Willie felt like it was important enough that, you know, he put it in his personal lab notebooks and he, when I interviewed him, he was disturbed that they made him take that out. And given that in the context of, we know that rickettsias were used as, as, biological agents and they were mixing them with viruses, you know, and so a lot of, a lot of people say, well, they didn't do genetic engineering back then, but they did so selective breeding, just like you do if you want turkeys with bigger breasts or, you know, pigs with better bacon. Willie definitely was doing selective breeding with ticks and other scientists at Dietrich were doing the sort of genetic manipulation on a crude level. So, I think the Rickettsial is important. No one's been looking at it since the book has come out. 
I think um, Ian Lipkin and Tokars have been sequencing a wider array of pathogens in the ticks around Long Island and Connecticut. So I'm heartened by that. And they found some new things. Okay, it looks like we have a couple of questions coming in through Facebook, so let me turn to those for a moment. Uh, do you think uh, that they are destroying evidence while we are waiting for the congressional uh, investigation? Uh, probably. <laughs> probably. You know, uh, since if you take my CDC FOIA, they were fast and loose with sending emails back and forth to each other, the people outside of the government and inside of the government. But once the FOIA worked its way through five and a half years in CDC, now they just do it back channels. I just did a FOIA and uh, <laughs> everything's back channels because there's nothing. It comes up nothing. So yeah, I'm sure they are. But the thing about the government is they file everything in, you know, 20 copies of everything and there's this rolling set of records that are coming out in different agencies. So for example, with the Cuban tick drop, uh, I had a live witness who was with the CIA company who told me about that, but I wasn't going to put it in the book because of a single source. You know, I wasn't a hundred percent sure. Did he really make it up? But the Kennedy assassination files were released on the CIA website in 2017 and 2018. And there I found the name of the project, Project Mongoose and like Cuba Project, Subproject Project 33B. And so then I put it in the book because uh, everything lined up. So Chris, I have a simple question here. Are you continuing your research? Um, Yes, slowly. I have a lot of stuff going on now, uh, but uh, a pretty famous director has optioned the book for a documentary, so I'm helping them with continuing research because it would be nice to add uh, a nice, nicer ending with more details filled in as these, as everything's, you know, coming to light. Hey, Bill, can I slip in a question? Oh, please do. Yes. Okay, so I've always wanted to ask this of someone in your position, Chris. Um, I've got a pet theory that, well, let me give you the premise first. I believe the premise of the IDSA standing by their outdated guidelines that Lyme is hard to get, it's easy to cure, you know, a couple of days of doxycycline, um, and that's all it takes. Um, no such thing as chronic Lyme and that stand that they take. I've always kind of thought that maybe the thread of the connection was someone involved at a military level, knowing government officials at their level of knowledge and awareness that it somehow got like, absorbed by quasi-sanctioned medical academic groups like the IDSA and taking it to insurance companies. And my pet theory is that insurance companies have gone to whoever and said, look, you caused this. We're not cleaning it up on our nickel. So you better find a way to clean this up on somebody else's nickel than our nickel. And that's how the IDSA got the dictate to come up with guidelines that are so clearly outdated, um, it's irresponsible. In my mind, that's a perfect, that's a perfect everything. Can you get that into your documentary? <laughs> well, I, hopefully, I mean, because I, as uh, every month I get more clarity on the the situation because uh, I always say it's like a hundred thousand piece puzzle and you know being at Stanford for 10 years I I try to follow the scientific method I have a hypothesis and then I ask how how can I test this hypothesis I look for documents that would either support it or debunk it so you know this is what 
I think may have happened and I don't have definitive proof. I, I go with Willie that there was an accident that had to do with Rick Hetzel's and um, they got out, people started dying and they knew that a dose, an early dose of doxy would, would cure the Rick Hetzel's, which are the most deadly. Lyme disease, you know, doesn't kill you or, or it just makes you wish you were dead, you know? <laughs> so then they thought, well, we'll just pay a handful of insider academic researchers to fast track the vaccine. Think COVID, you know, insiders who we can, we can, so, so we'll tell everybody Doxy cures Lyme. Actually, Doxy does not cure Lyme. I mean, it's one of, it's pretty ineffective, actually. Uh, penicillins are better. So they thought they could fast track the vaccine. The vaccine got embroiled with controversy and it caused harm. And all this is the cautionary tale for COVID. And I wish we, we could learn from that. But so then you had these researchers that were on the vaccine gravy train. And they, I mean, I've had, this is not substantiated, but they got paid hundreds of thousand dollars to be in the vaccine gravy train. And then they publish on it a certain thing, like the criteria of Lyme disease. They kept it narrow so the vaccine looks better, you know, and then they're stuck with a body of work and they don't want to contradict it. Like the thing an academic never wants to do is say, oops, I was wrong, even though that's the normal course of science, you know. So that, that's what I think happened. Now, uh, now the group that says the disease is a certain way, some of them are getting sued by patients. And so they have even more reason to not fess up. So that's, that's what I think. But again, it's not proven. All right, Chris, we have another question. Uh, this patient asks, she, she says that her LL, LLMD has traced her infection back to 1956, and she wants to know if that fits into your timeline at all or not, or does that predate your timeline? Well, again, that's the reason we need to know when and where they release pathogens. So I know 56 and 57, there were open-air releases of live viruses um, in Florida and near the Dietrich area, you know, so... What I would love to do, if I had some way to fund it, is to do a map and, and put little pins on it that says, you know, this is the year there were open air releases of microbes, and these are the locations. And then people like this person can go back and say, oh, yeah, I was at Elgin based in Florida, and there was a huge outbreak then of a chronic fatigue-like neuro thing, and maybe it was this open air test that happened. Chris, I believe you already touched on this question, but I'm, I'm going to ask this anyway. Do you have a hypothesis on why the IDSA physicians are vehement, vehemently opposed to further furthering the research on diagnostics and treatment of tick-borne diseases? Well, there, I mean, I, I sort of drilled down to the background of all 14 of them in the original guidelines, and they're all uh, – as different as snowflakes, and they all have slightly different motives. I mean, I think an overriding motivator is these guys who are in their 70s, and mostly they publish 200 to 300 articles a piece saying Lyme disease is one thing, and they don't want to say, oops, I was wrong. Are you worried about your own safety? Um, during the research of the book, there were certain times where I was, and I was told by people who know, like people in the bioweapons world, that I should watch my back. But once the book was out, I felt um, less anxious because it's in the public domain now. And, you know, a year after it's been published, I haven't had any, any serious, like, uh, confrontal, no one's confronted me and said what's in there is false, which I think is good. And I'm hoping there are other people like me who are pulling on the threads that I left open. Okay, next question. Uh, do you find any evidence that the spirochete is actually a Trojan horse uh, delivering a payload of microbes? I, okay, there, I haven't found anything specifically about Borrelia burgdorferi, 
but there was this whole program which I call nested rushing Russian dolls where they would put and this is documented in other books they would get a bacterium and they would put a virus in it and a toxin in it and so then they would aerosolize it spray it on an enemy and what would happen is people would get sick with flu-like symptoms a healthcare worker would give them antibiotics it would kill the bacteria but release the virus and and the um, toxin and the person would just die a horrible death quickly so there were things on both the russian side and the u.s side where they experimented with that hopefully not in the real world So I, I would say there was work on putting microbes in worms. And I know Willie found worms on Long Island, deer worms, but there's, you know, you can't prove that that was part of the active biological weapons program. Yeah. Okay. And I believe this, um, this question is concerning, um, the, um, the investigation of Chris Smith, but what is the current status of the request of, of a report to Congress? I, I, I haven't checked for about a week, but I think it's still in the budget. It hasn't been cut yet. Recess is about to happen, so anything could happen, and a lot is going on in Washington right now, but I think it's still there. It got killed last year, right, right in December, right before just as the impeachment stuff was coming down. Okay, here's a question. Uh, you mentioned it took five years to recover. Do you have any sense of what a typical recovery time is for people uh, with Lyme and co-infections? Just your opinion. Uh, yeah, I mean, it just depends on your co-infections. With Lyme disease alone, some people have said for every year you're sick, it'll take you a year to get better. But my husband and I caught our infection or we treated for it um, in, at month 11. And so we're both good now. Um, and it didn't, but it took longer than a year. You know, it just depends on the co-infections. Some co-infections are super hard to get rid of. And I believe if you have Lyme alone, it's easy to lick, but combine it with Bartonella or Babesia. Babesia especially, there's published literature that says it makes it hard to get over it. Okay, here's an interesting question. Uh, the medical resistance uh, to chronic Lyme, is that only here in America or are other countries also uh, resistant to admitting that there's chronic Lyme? I think a lot of countries follow the U.S. lead because we're so prolific at publishing and and the people who publish on Lyme are so forceful in their opinions. You know, the thing I, I really drilled down on in the documentary was understanding how the scientific publishing business can be manipulated. And what I didn't, it was too detailed to go into the film, but what I did is I took the 60 top journals and they're rated by importance and how much they're read by this thing called an impact factor. And all of those 60, all but two are volunteer um, review editors. And so the IDSA placed sentries on most of those volunteer staff. And so if anything came up that contradicted their point of view, it would get blackballed. It would never see the, the journal's pages. So, you know, I, I documented that and I, I, I believe that's it that's a dynamic that's affected it. And same on the funding. So the NIH review committees, and you talk to any scientist in the running for an NIH review, and they'll uh, confirm this. And that is you can, you can game the NIH funding review committees very easily. Same way, you get sentries on the volunteer committees, and they, the two people that do detailed reviews of you know, tick-borne stuff, easily blackball things that don't jive with their point of view. And, you know, it's why you don't have the giant breakthroughs in NIH funded grants a lot of times because they're very conservative. Uh, a lot of times the people on the review committees want to see what's new and they want to suppress the competition. OK, 
Okay, very good. I'm going to slip in uh, one or two of my own questions again. Um, you mentioned the eight ball. Mm -hmm. uh, what what was going on with the eight ball? Did the test subjects contract Lyme disease or or something else? Well, like I said, Lyme disease. I never had proof that that was used. That was ever taken seriously as a biological weapon. But certainly, I mean, the go-to agents were anthrax, tularemia, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, and those were all, oh, Colorado tick fever virus, I think, was on the list. So those were all candidates to be tested. And, you know, they, <laughs> yeah, so is there, what else, it was, did I answer that question? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think you did, yep. <laughs> I, I'll say something about, so the media sort of spun the is Lyme disease a bioweapon thing out of control. And, you know, part of it's my fault because Lyme is in the title. I mean, it's Lyme the backstory, but also that these other weaponized germs, I believe, are at the root of the people who can't ever get better. But my detractors say, oh, well, Lyme disease could never be a biological weapon because we found it in that Utsi the Iceman in Europe that was, you know, where we sequenced his genome, et cetera. So I went back a, a couple of weeks ago and actually read that scientific paper. And it turns out they only sequenced 60% of the Borrelia's DNA. So really you can't prove that the Borrelia in the Iceman is the same thing that was around Lyme, Connecticut in the mid sixties, right? Because if you look at human DNA and duck DNA, they're about 60% different too. So anyways, when people say that, <laughs> I say, what about the ducks? <laughs> um, what about the role of viruses? Or could viruses be used or could they be an implicating factor uh, in people that would test negative for Lyme disease but have uh, the symptoms of Lyme disease? Yes, I'm definitely. And like, the Powassan virus, super deadly, it can be transmitted in, I think, two to five hours of attachment, not the 48 to 72 hours that the CDC says. So viruses are a factor, and that's why I really, really believe we need a rapid test that tests, like, like Eric was saying with the ticks, that tests for the top five to ten deadliest tick-borne diseases for human blood. You know, and especially, I worry, especially this year, because all the resources to do tick surveillance and are moving over to COVID, and the symptoms of tick-borne diseases are almost identical in the beginning to COVID. So I just, I'm worried about what's going to happen between September and January when, you know, all these people are told, nope, you're not sick, you don't have COVID, and then they have some sort of weird mixed set of tick-borne diseases. Okay, did you find in any of your research any uh, any evidence uh, anything was done with uh, anaplasma? So uh, I always put that in the back of my mind as something to look into. Anaplasma was a, classified as a rickettsia, and it's been found in Wisconsin. And, you know, the very first Lyme cases were found in northern Wisconsin, which is you know, you ask why is the first outbreak or the big two biggest outbreaks in Wisconsin and the East Coast? Wisconsin was the headquarters of the biological weapons program, the mastermind of that program. Ira Baldwin at, at University of Wisconsin in Madison is there, and he had a bunch of farms where he would test all sorts of things: potato blight and anthrax. Uh, so, anyways, that's that's as Willie would say when I would ask a hard question. You know. Could anaplasma be uh, a bioweapon? I would say, like he would say in his German accent, question. That's what he would say, <laughs> question. Okay, I apologize, everyone, if I don't get to all of your questions. Um, if you have questions that remain unanswered, please um, please uh, contact us at PA Lyme. Uh, you can go, go to our uh, website. Uh, and find our email address and, and send us questions, which is info at palime.org, or you can go to our Facebook page and send us messages that way as well. Uh, Eric, I think I'm going to turn it over to you at this point uh, for a wrap-up. Okay, thanks, Bill. Um, 
Chris, thank you. Um, phenomenal research work, a great presentation. Would be very interested in anything in the future that you're a part of. I mean, we think you have a gift with that. I had said earlier that most in-person meetings have been canceled across the state. I know some of the meetings like Columbia Line, uh, they are meeting outside, which I heard has gone very well. I know a lot of the local support groups are starting to do smaller Zoom meetings like this, but capping it at maybe 10 people. So more of a open discussion, Q&A, more of an, an intimate, informal <laughs> kind of get together. I know that um, Lehigh Valley is doing that, Delco Lime is doing that, uh, Harrisburg Lime is considering doing that. I know Pittsburgh Lime has and is considering doing that. So just know that what we are also going to do is um, if you're a member of a local support region that is not going to do Zoom kind of Q&A and open discussion, we're going to try to get um, uh, the availability to everyone to participate on those. So stay tuned. You know, when this all started, we thought, we didn't know what we thought, 30, 60, 90 days. Uh, it's pretty clear this is going to go on for quite a while. So we recognize the necessity of turning our education and awareness uh, to more of a virtual technology medium than face-to-face. Than -face. So with that, September 8th will be the next uh, second Tuesday of the month in September and then October. So be on the lookout for more of our Zoom virtual Lyme Impact uh, sessions coming up. Uh, and with that, just thank you very much. We appreciate the, the, the donations, any financial aid that we get. I think everybody knows we're a nonprofit that has no paid salary. So any support we get is widely, widely appreciated. So with that, I would like to say thank you for attending. This will be on PA Lines Facebook. It will be on our YouTube channel. We will get access to the slide deck for those that would like access to it. So uh, if you have any needs, just let us know. Bill, thank you so much for moderating. And Chris, again, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Thanks. Bye. Good night, everybody.